We give our thanks to Sister Tasha for that word this morning on honor. Hallelujah. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Hallelujah. When I ask you the following questions, I want your yes to be an amen, okay? Amen? amen. Because we say amen a lot, don't we? Amen. Is amen just church talk? It ought to, to, if it naturally just comes out of us, it needs to mean something, right? Now, this is the week of Thanksgiving, and we need to be thankful for more than just one week out of the year. But how many is thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ? Amen? How many is thankful for the new life that getting saved gives you? Amen? Hallelujah. How many is thankful that you woke up this morning alive? Amen? How many know there's a reason behind that? And his name is Jesus. Amen? Hallelujah. And so when I ask you these things, hey, how about this? How many is committed to living the rest of their life for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Amen? Some people are raising their hands, Brother Gary. Amen? Isn't that great? Hallelujah. Some people are committed. Amen? Hallelujah. And so watch this. Give me the last week's note number one. Give me last week's note number one. To live a life of honor, we must back up our amen. Right? Amen can't just be something that rolls off of my tongue uh, without me backing it up. If I'm going to say amen to it, I need to do something about it if I'm not. Yes. You're already looking at me like, oh, he's going there already. Okay. Oh, come on. If you go ahead and smile right quick, it'll be a short one instead of a long one. Yeah. Amen. Smile. Everybody smile. Amen. Everybody smile. All right, I'll preach short then. Amen. Look, look, if you live a life of honor, you've got to back up your amen because nobody don't like hypocrisy. Amen. Even hypocrites hate hypocrisy. It don't work nowhere. The Bible says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Mean what you say, say what you mean, and back it up. Yes. Hallelujah. And so we need to back up our amen if we're going to live a life of honor. Amen. Now where we are in this portion of scripture, right back in last week's text, at the period when Israel's judges uh, is coming to an end and they're on the verge of their first appointment of king. Verse 1. We'll read it real quick. It says in verse 1 of 1 Samuel chapter 8, Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Right? The name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second Abijah they were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old. That's kind of insulting. And your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. The thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. That I should not reign over them according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also now. Therefore, heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. Be careful what you ask for, because you just might get it. Amen. 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 Be, look, you need to be prepared what you're praying for. You need to be prepared for what it is you've been praying for. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we'll go into this and say, God, give me this. God, grant that. God, I need a breakthrough in this. And guess what? We're not prepared to receive what it is we're even asking for. Amen? Right. Hallelujah. So we've got to be prepared for that which it is we're asking for. Amen? And I know we're in this series. We're going to be in it tonight, uh, today uh, and next week as well. But I'm here to tell you these messages stand alone even if you weren't here last week and even if you didn't get to see it or see it on YouTube or whatnot. Amen? They stand alone by themselves. But we've got just a small window of time right now before I baptize folks. Or actually, Jason West, our assistant pastor, is going to baptize the folks today for the first time. Amen? Doing a little training this morning. Hallelujah. 
I get to choreograph it and narrate it. Amen? Hallelujah. And so I'm going to be like a sportscaster off to the side while he's, he's in the water there. Amen? Hallelujah. Uh, we were going to pour some ice in there while I go to kind of prank on him a little bit. But I didn't want to do that to y'all, all right? Okay. All right. But anyway, I want you to have your hearts open today. We've got a small window of time. And the devil wants to rob every single person in here of the seed that God wants to sow into your life right now. You came to church, you might as well get a whole lot out of it. Amen. We have celebrated, we've praised, we've worshipped. Amen. We're going to witness the baptism. Amen. For people who have said, I'm living for Jesus now. It's a wonderful day. We've got some more music here in a little while. But listen. God wants to give you something that will change your life, change your outlook, and get you to see things. Amen. The way the Word of God uh, aligns our lives to see it. Amen. And I want to receive everything He wants to give to me because He's too good for me not to want to get everything that He has for me. Amen. So is there anybody in here right now, hallelujah, ready for the living Word of God? Anybody excited about the Bible today? Hallelujah. Pastor Jerry Brazil to stand today and claim victory over this message today. Father God, we're so grateful that you're not a God of a far off. But Father, we feel your presence, your mercy, and your love even among us. Thank you, Lord. I cry out oh, to you this morning, oh my God. And I ask you to bless Pastor Daniel this morning. I pray, God, that you'll put the fire in him and your word this morning. That it'll go out and capture the heart of each one that's present here today. Oh, God, I pray that no need will go in bed. I ask, Lord, first of all, that every spiritual need be met here today. Oh, God, if there's anybody among us this morning that don't know you, I pray as Pastor Daniel speaks this morning, that old time convicted yes. of God will come upon them in real tears and run down their face, God, that they'll make their way to the altar this morning. We are grateful for the baptism that's about to take place. But we know the greatest thing that happened here this morning, God, is though this lost and undone on the way to hell this morning, God, if they would come forth out of their seat to humble themselves and fall on their face before you, God, and cry out and ask for your mercy and your forgiveness this morning, we claim oh, that with power and a party over this service this morning, no uh, force of the day. My brother will have a voice, a voice that will be clear. He'll speak with a part and power this morning. Such a way that hallelujah, she come on, say that. That every devil in hell would tremble. Oh. All hell and all heaven will know that God's man and now is standing forth to break the red of life. Be open up our spiritual mouth this morning. God, be ready to receive. Receive your word this morning. Carry with us, God. We just thank you. We love you. We honor you. We praise you. We look for good things to take place even now. In Jesus' holy name. Somebody give Amen. you a praise for that. Thank you, Pastor. We know what our series is titled, Despite Your Amen. Somebody say it with me. Despite Your Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, as we said before, our amen means more than any religious cliched statement. It's an agreement and a declaration of unity to sound words and teaching, as well as a verbal punctuation at the conclusion of our prayers that solidifies its very meaning. And its very meaning is, so be it. Amen? So be it. In essence, Lord, let this be according to your will. That's the way Jesus prayed in the garden, right? Not my will, but your will be done. Amen? Yet oftentimes, despite our amen, we may go and do the exact opposite from what we declared in agreement to. Even how we're taught. We were taught one way, but we do another. Amen? Paul even talked about it in Romans chapter 7. He said, why do I do what I hate? And why don't I do what I should do? Even Paul, an unmarried man, hallelujah, a man that was uh, not involved in anything but ministry, totally dedicated his whole life, consecrated his whole life uh, to the teachings of Jesus Christ, a man not living in, in, in sin, a man that was dedicated to the gospel in every way, shape, or form, still says, I do things that I ought not to do. I do things the wrong way at times. I don't do what I should do. 
even he was dealing with that. Amen? I'm here to tell you the people of the Bible, amen, are real people that you and I can relate to. Hallelujah. And so last week we focused on the hearts of two individuals. And that was Joel and Abijah, the sons of Samuel, in our first message, when the children of the anointed go astray. And we talked about raising them up in the way that they should go and doing the right things. But guess what? They still may turn to the world anyway. I was drugged. To, before I had a drug problem, I had a, 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 another drug problem. My mama drugged me to church. She drugged me to Bible school. She drugged me to Sunday school. But when I became a teenager, I still thought I knew it all and went out and, and hurt myself and beat myself down for 28 years and allowed the devil to wreck my life. Thank God at 28, though, hallelujah, I decided I wanted to be a better person, a better dad, a better husband, amen. Little did I know that God was going to let me preach his gospel, amen. So I'm here to tell you, we know that the prodigal, yes, he wandered off. He didn't depart. He wandered off. It was still in his heart. If it wasn't in his heart, Pastor Jason, he'd have never said in the ditch, I could go back to my father's house. Now, even though he was not prepared to go back in the way that he should as a son, he still knew he could go there. And for every person that's not with you in church right now, you might have raised your kids right. You might have raised them to love God. You raised them in the teachings of Jesus Christ. Amen. And you were in this altar last week claiming some things. The altar was filled with mamas and daddies and grandparents calling out, crying out to God for their children. Amen. Their adult children. Because I said, it's a rare thing to find kids that go up through a, a youth group, graduate from high school, get to college age or young career age, and are still in church. Because they're saying millennials now don't have any faith base. Right? Because when we turn them over to the professors and they preach atheism, they pull away everything. They try to pull away. Everything that we raised them up in. But it doesn't mean they departed. Amen? Amen. Don't claim that they've departed. They've wandered off. Yes. And that which they've departed from, they shall return to. I told yes. you 2018 yes. is going to be a fantastic year. Yes. And you claimed it. You saw them in tears. You saw them in the altar. You saw them being baptized like these young people here are today. Amen? These are all young people being baptized here today. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so we need to claim that, amen, when the children of the anointed go astray. Quit beating yourself up for what you didn't do. Yes, you may have made some mistakes. You might have been focused too much in one area and neglected another. We'll talk about that momentarily. But amen, claim them coming back in Jesus' name. Now when it comes to Samuel's sons, they were perhaps even blinded to their ways. Verse 3 tells us that they did not walk in Samuel's ways. Samuel's ways were righteous. Samuel's ways were of God. They did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain. They took bribes and they perverted justice. They did all these things, right? Let's look at note one for this week. Unaddressed sin in our lives can become so comfortable and even blinding to the point of serving God in sin. You ever thought about that? I'm talking about people in church now. Jesus. These boys were in church. They were judges, appointed under judges, that were appointed for an entire territory in Israel called Beersheba. They were priests. A judge was to be priest and prophet and like the role of their father, Samuel. Yet they had been taught ministry, but they hadn't been taught how to be men. We don't just need more men of ministry. We need men of God. Give me men of God, you'll have a man in the ministry. Give me a man of God that has integrity, that does the right thing even when folks aren't looking. That will show honor even when he don't agree with somebody. Hallelujah. Show me a man of integrity. Show me a man of God. And we'll get the ministry done. Amen. Hallelujah. Unaddressed sin in our lives can become so comfortable and even blinded to the point of serving God in sin. Because you look back at your works, you say, you know what? I still got this 
going on. Pastor don't know about it. Church folk don't know about it, but I'm paying my tithes. I'm there on Sundays. I show my face. They need something. I do it. I do this and I do that. But you've got some things in your heart that could perhaps a while back you might have testified were over and done with, yet you've returned to them. Amen. But you start keeping up with your works and saying, this is good enough. This is good enough. God sees what you're still in, and you've been serving God in sin. That will not pack the pews this morning. But we are in the last rows of this thing called life here on earth. And we better get ready because the Messiah that Tasha was talking about, he is coming back. What will he find us in? Praise God. Bless you, Lord. Jesus, here I am. I'm in church. Yeah, you're in church, but you're not in Christ. Right, but I got time to do this this morning. Do I just need to wrap it up? Watch this. Note number two. Give me note number two. Serving God in sin causes someone on the winning side to come out on the losing end. Every single time. Hallelujah. It's good that you paid your tithe. It's good that you did this and did that for the church. It's good. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm glad of that. We need people to do that. Hallelujah. But watch out. Watch out with that thing that you won't address. That thing is still a problem. That thing you still think you can get away with. Hallelujah. Serving God in sin called. You're supposed to be on the winning side. Christians, we're on the winning side. Read the end of the Bible. We win. Satan loses. Loses. We win. I don't want to be on the winning side. But come up on the losing end. Hallelujah. Oh, somebody. Somebody back me up this yes. morning. Now finally, concerning the sons of Samuel, we spoke of Samuel's example, which was Eli. Remember how he raised his kids? Eli was a great judge too. He was a great priest. But his sons, perhaps all he did was show them ministry too. Because they were fornicating with women in the lobby of the church. They were having affairs with, with women in the house of God. They were bringing the sin into the house and committing it there. There's got to be something wrong with somebody, amen, that would do something in the house of God. Even when I was a sinner, sinner, Brother Chuck, there were things that I would never bring down here for Jerry Brazil to put it up with, amen. I'm going to do it, amen. Now I needed to be here and I could come in my sin, amen, but I was going to leave it at the door and honor the house of God. Somebody back me up this morning. Samuel may have taught his son's ministry, but perhaps not completely about life. Watch note number three this morning. When we overdevelop one area of life, we could underdevelop another. We focus so much on one thing, on one area, and we do this and do this and do this, and all of a sudden there's another important area that got neglected. And it's hard. Raising kids. It's hard raising sons. It's hard raising up and developing men for the next generation. It's tough. Hallelujah. We don't want to beat them down. We don't want to make them feel like they're failures. Amen. It is tough to do the right things. Amen. For these young men. Hallelujah. But I'm here to tell you right now. If your young son is in church, you better thank God right now. If your teenage son is in church, you better thank God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your holy name. Now, that was last week. That's what we focused on last week. So let's focus our attention now on whom the nation of Israel requested. Right? If I had to give this second message a title, it would be this. It would be this. The fallout from Philians. The fallout. Somebody say the fallout from Philians. The fallout from Philians. Let's look at verse 6. So they said, make us a king to judge us. And this thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people. Maybe listen to them. 
I know this has hurt you. I know you feel like you're nothing. I know you feel like they've discounted you, but you need to listen to them. In other words, God says, I'm going to give them what they want. In all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you. They rejected me. I've had to look at this many times throughout my tenure as a pastor. Because many times, people aren't rejecting the man of God. Right. They're rejecting the God of the man. Hallelujah. Don't mean that a pastor's never wrong. Don't mean that he don't make mistakes. It doesn't mean that he didn't catch it right. Amen. But I have learned that a lot of times they're not rejecting me. They're rejecting God. That I should not reign over them, verse 8, according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt. God is rehearsing their history and what He has done for them, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods. They didn't need nothing else but me, but they kept, kept turning away from me. And now they're doing the same thing to you also. In other words, what you're feeling, the rejection you're feeling, Samuel, I have felt it since the beginning of time. Verse 9, now therefore heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. I'm talking about the fallout from Philians. When it comes to this idea, the fallout from Philians, even still with Samuel's sons, when we look at them, what if they could have gone on to be mighty chief prophets that would have served the nation's king? Who was king after Saul? David. David had a prophet that served him. His name was Nathan. And when David was in sin, God showed Nathan the prophet exactly what David had done. And the bold prophet Nathan came to him, told him a parable about a rich man stealing from a poor man. And David said, that is a travesty. That rich man must be killed right now. Where is he? Who is he? And Nathan the prophet said, you are the man. Yes. What if that could have been Joel or Abijah standing in that position. If you don't want what God has for you, He'll give it to somebody else. If you don't obey the calling on your life, God will raise up somebody else. But God will also let a fill in get in there. And He will allow a fallout to happen because of it. Amen? The reason there's a fallout from a filling is always because somebody missed their destiny. Somebody didn't obey God. Somebody didn't want the way that God gave it to them. They prayed for it. They asked for it. They fasted about it. They cried out. They had a prayer circle, a prayer chain going on. They texted everybody. They made a Facebook post and said, y'all pray for this. I need a breakthrough. Then God gave it to them. They said, I don't like the way that God has brought me my breakthrough. And so because of that, God gives it to somebody else. Then all of a sudden, they thrive in the very thing and become the very thing that you had longed to be. And you said, man, I missed it. I missed it because I wanted it my way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Give me note number four. In life, when we attempt to fill a void in life with that which isn't supposed to be, we act in the flesh and are headed for trouble. People have voids in life and they're so desperate to fill that void because nobody likes a void. They're so desperate to fill that void that they get all caught up in it. And instead of waiting for God's best, you settle for less. So I'm going somewhere with this. And you're acting the flesh and you're always headed for some level, some kind of level of trouble. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen? amen. Now God said you're in a rush for a king, right? You're in a rush for a king, and you want one right now. Isn't that the kind of culture we have? I want it, and I want it right now. Amen. You want your chicken nuggets right now. <laughs> and you want them hot and fresh. You want your piece, pizza hot and ready. Glory. That's one of the most wonderful things that have ever come out of me. Hot and ready, right now, five dollars. <laughs> we want everything right this minute, right now. God says you're in a rush for a king and you want one now. 
Because you want a king out of pride. That's why you want one, and we'll look at that next week, the reason they wanted a king. Because you want one out of pride, I'll give you a prideful man as a king. I'm going to give you what it is you're asking for. Was Saul their first king? Was Saul a Philian? Could he have been? What if God had intended for David to be the first king? Right? We looked at that. Reverend Larry Decker, you, you preached a message years ago of where you pointed out that it really looks like it was God's intention for the Apostle Paul to be the 12th disciple that would take the place of Jesus. That's one of those what-if things. But when you see the churches he established and you see all the people that he reached and you see how he wrote over half of the New Testament, we don't hear nothing about Matthias. Now, I'm sure he did some things and God honored it. And I've even had it researched. And yes, he did a few things. He did, but nothing to the, the, the level that Paul did. Could it have been that they rushed, casting those lots, they were ready to fill in real quick instead of waiting for what God wanted to do? Because at that time, he didn't look like the Apostle Paul. He didn't act like the Apostle Paul. He was Saul of Tarsus, uh, a, a, a megalomaniac bounty hunter out there uh, trying to persecute and kill Christians, right? He was a Pharisee. Amen. Sometimes the breakthrough don't look like what you want it to look like, but you've got to wait for God to refine it. You've got to wait for God to drown everything that it don't need and clean it up. Wait for God's best. He's got something out there. He can be cleaning up for you right now. Amen. Amen. But what if God had intended for David to be the first king? Why do I think that? Well, if you remember, after Solomon, after Solomon, we see a period in the Bible of the divided kingdom. When you read about the divided kingdom, you see that Israel was split in two. It was still called Israel in the north, with its capital city being Samaria. In the south, it was called Judah, with its capital city being Jerusalem. Now, there were various different kings in the north from various different tribes in Israel that ruled. And many times, Brother Brian, it would always say that they did not follow the ways of God. They turned to idolatry. They, did, they messed up. But when it comes to the southern kings down in Judah, it would always say, most of the time, there was a few of them that were bad and greedy, but there were way more of them who aligned their lives and their governing to the word of God. And they, even though the kings in the north church were from various different tribes, the ones in the south were from one tribe. And that's the tribe of Judah. The same tribe that David was from. What if God had always intended that if they're going to have a king, if they're not satisfied with me ruling over them and listening to my prophets, and they want a king like everybody else, it's going to be the one that I choose in the time that I allow it. And at this time, David isn't even hardly tending to his father's sheep yet and killing lions and bears. He's not fought a, a, a nine-foot uh, Philistine giant named Goliath yet. He's probably just a little toddler at this time, if even that. It wasn't time for David to be king, but they were in a rush. What if Saul was a fill-in and God intended David to be the first king? Saul was a Benjamite. Saul was from a tribe that if you read the end of the book of Judges, and I know I'm getting a little teachy here, you go back. At the end of the book of Judges, the Benjamites were almost wiped out and eradicated due to an abominable, horrible sin. They were all, there was almost nothing left of them. Yet David was from the tribe of Judah. And Judah means praise. So you have Saul, a man of pride, a man from pride, and you have David, a man from praise. Hallelujah. Right? Hallelujah. Listen, even while King Saul uh, was, 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 was king, he, it took praise to soothe some, what they said, many people have translated it as in headaches. <coughs> they said he had migraines. Bible don't say that though. They said he had a tormented spirit. 
Sometimes we don't want to call things the spiritual things. We want to call things something practical, something we can understand, something that a doctor or somebody in medicine has explained to us. And I'm all about doctors. I love them. Amen. I, believe, I know that God raised them up. Amen. Hallelujah. But the Bible don't say nothing about no migraine headaches. It says a tormented spirit was on him. Amen. His pride was catching up with him. Not putting God first in what he was doing was catching up with him. Doesn't mean God wouldn't have given him a chance. He gave him a chance. You're king. What are you going to do with it? Wow. You're king now. What are you going to do with it? Yet it took David coming in with his heart and playing some praise and worship. Yes. The man of praise had to play some praise to soothe his pain from that tormented spirit. Because see, when the praise and the worship goes up, the devil's got to go. Yes. The devil's got to go. Saul wouldn't work because pride was there instead of praise. Amen? Although he was equipped, although he was given opportunity, although he was given chances, amen, he didn't submit to praise. He held on to pride. Amen? And when you got pride, watch what pride does. Give me note number five. Pride always blocks true praise. I ain't just talking about the act of praising either in the church. But yeah, it'll do it. Block me. I couldn't lift my hands up. I was afraid somebody's going to see me. I'm not going to come in here and show. Nobody, I, and then all of a sudden, I got a little bit of a, this going. <laughs> then I got a little bit of that going. But as the choir would start singing, it was a great thing mm -hmm. that it did for me. Woo! I would feel something come over me, Sister Ashley, and I would just feel like I was about to fall flat on the floor, and the higher my hands got, the freer I felt, the better I felt, amen, and I got addicted to praising and worshiping God. I didn't care what nobody thought. I didn't care what nobody said. I didn't care if they snickered about it. That was their problem, amen. Me and Pastor Jason did that this morning. 
I made coffee this morning. <laughs> Took me forever. <laughs> really, I'm just I'm walking in. There it is. Hallelujah. We're not filling in. We're backing up. Supporting one another. Amen. Hallelujah. And so, if you saw something that worked better than what was there, you didn't see a feeling. You saw a fix. Right? Don't mistake a feeling for a fix. Don't mistake a fix for a feeling. People settle for feelings in all areas of life. Being impetuous, meaning rushing to make a decision. Rushing to do something just because it needs to be done. Rushing, being impetuous, all that. It causes one to settle for a feeling. I'm about to get personal. Y'all pray for me. When you settle for a feeling and you're impetuous, it could cause you to settle for Mr. Wrong instead of Mr. Right. It could cause you to settle for Mrs. Wrong instead of Mrs. Right. Right? Then you got a problem on your hands. You gotta do something about it then. Take up, take up. <laughs> they gotta act like it's not out of me. I just said it's not in church, y'all forgive me. <laughs> right? Why not wait for God's best? Right. Let it feel right. Amen. Let it feel comfortable. Let it feel good. Oh. If they bring out the best in you, you're on the right path. Amen. Yeah. Come on, I wanna help some people today. Amen. When they send you a message or they call you on the phone, you, you might be in the right place then. I still get that today when my wife calls me. God. We've been married 15 years now. Amen? Hallelujah. That's the way it should be. Can I get an amen? amen? So you might settle for the wrong person. How about this? Being impetuous, settling for a feeling could cause us to settle for religion. Instead of a relationship. <laughs> My goodness. Well, I could preach for a week on that. And we say amen to that. And I've been talking about it for nine years. But guess what? That is such a stronghold in the life of people that they will, despite their amen. Yes, Pastor. Amen, Pastor. We don't want religion, we want a relationship. Amen. But that is such a stronghold on their mind. They can't get away from it. They can't get away from the rule that says, I gotta walk this tightrope, and I can't do this, and I can't do that. If I do this, if I slip up one time, I'm going to hell. If I slip up one time, I'm not good enough no more. I am disqualified. That's what religion will do. That's why the Pharisees walked around with their noses held up in the air and didn't even have compassion for the people that they were supposed to be ministering to. Jesus got mad two times in the Bible. When he saw greed in the house of the Lord, he went in there and turned over the tables. And then when he saw the men of God who was supposed to be carrying out the ministry acting like hypocrites, it put some quotation marks and an exclamation point behind what he said. He said, he didn't say, you hypocrites. That's right. He said, you hypocrites. Jesus got mad. Yes, he did. Because they had settled for less. They had settled for the greed. They had settled for, settled for the offerings that paid their salaries and they weren't willing to reach out with love and compassion that comes from the Father, amen. They were given the greatest position in all the world and that was to declare the gospel, amen. And we still, they thought they were worthy of it. They were never worthy of it. And they were teaching it to other people and it passed down the line and passed down the line. And that veil was torn when Jesus died. And preachers have been preaching the new covenant ever since. And it can be so hard to preach that new covenant and get that religion and that law off of people's minds. Now, we don't need to get loose and have so much freedom that it's a free-for-all when we dishonor God. Because you have that in churches too. 
Amen. 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 But at the same time, we can't settle for religion when we can have a relationship. Because here's the thing. That religion will show you a rule. And you'll know the boundaries of it. And then when you break it, you'll go back and say, forgive me, Lord. I broke it again, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Or either you'll walk in such condemnation. But when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, here's the thing. Well, what are you saying, Daniel? They can go do whatever they want to? No. When you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then you, like David, have tasted and seen that He is good. Amen? And when you have really tasted and seen that He is good, it would take a whole lot of bad stuff to ever pull you back down to where you were. And even if that happens, He's filled with grace that says, come on back. I'll give you another chance. Amen? settle for less. Wait for God's best. Don't settle for man-made religion. Settle for a relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. When you settle for a relation, when you settle for religion, guess what? Here's another thing God showed me. You walk around, you're in church, you might even have a title, but you have a lack of faith in your life. Amen? Because you're not trying to get to know deeply the one you represent. Amen? You can't have faith and speak to these things. Listen, when you get that report that says you tested positive for cancer, don't take religion in there. Take a relationship in there. Amen? Take and say, no, I know what you're saying, but the one that lives inside of me don't have no cancer. The one that lives inside of me, hallelujah, created me, hallelujah, before I was even born. And they're 
somebody with something else. We just got to tell them you don't need heroin. You don't need that bottle of pills. You need the Lord. Amen. Everybody's a bond servant to something. Everybody's a slave to something. Either fear or faith. That's why I love that song that says, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of faith. Paul said he was a bond servant. He was a slave to Jesus Christ. That's not an impending dictatorship. That's freedom like you've never known. Finally, with Saul, we see God allow to fill in. He allowed it. He allowed it. Give me the last note we're done. God may allow a counterfeit to fill in where you're too impatient to wait for His best. What is a counterfeit? It's something that looks real, but it's not. Counterfeit. It really looks real. That counterfeit money looked like real money. But it was counterfeit. And God will allow it to fill in when you're too impatient to wait for His best. Wait for God's best. Relinquish what you need to relinquish. Get right with God. I want everybody to stand to your feet. Did you get anything out of this? Now you say this is not a good time to be coming to an altar. People are about to get baptized. You got other things to do. Besides, 